Wait, where? What? I'm in a box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. <laughs> With your host, Daniel Clark. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Escape the Zoo Podcast, where we talk everything wildlife. Today's guest is Niall McCann, an explorer, biologist, and frontline conservationist who currently serves as the Director of Conservation for National Park Rescue, a direct action conservation organization that focuses on preventing the slaughter of elephants, rhinos, and lions in Sub-Saharan Africa. We talk about giant otters, tapirs, catching pythons and anacondas, the roar of a tiger, and have a very deep discussion on the current state of conservation in Africa. I found the conversation to be very fascinating and super, super interesting. I hope you do too. So without further ado, here it is, my chat with the one and only Niall McCann. Well, Niall, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I love your work and I'm super excited to talk, but to be honest, you've done so many crazy wild <laughs> expeditions that it's really hard to figure out where to start. But I figured I'd start at the way, way beginning, which is your grandfather was actually a, a big explorer himself, right? Is that what really brought you into this line of work? I, I suppose, you know, when they say like the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree, uh, in, in our case, the apple really hasn't fallen that far. So me and my brothers... <laughs> really kind of yeah, picked up where my parents left off and my mum had picked up where her dad left off. So her dad was Colonel Patrick Baird, who was a Lieutenant Colonel in the, in the army. He was the professor of geography at McGill University. He was the director of the Arctic Institute of North America. And he led multiple expeditions into the Canadian Arctic, mainly oh, wow. on Bat Island. So there's, there's a peak named after him and there's a peninsula named after him. And there's a lake named after my grandmother and all that type of stuff. So he was he was doing loads of stuff in northern Canada, oh, really. Wow. The well, from 1934 or there or thereabouts up until the 60s and 70s, and then he he died when I was only two. So I never got to meet him, which is a great shame because I'm sure we would have oh, had a lot. Too bad. Yeah, we'd have had a lot to talk about. So that was a great shame. But I had a really nice thing happen just in Halloween this this last year. So just three months ago. I was up in Churchill, Manitoba, and I was doing a little project with some polar bears. And I knew that my grandfather had been to somewhere in the Arctic and done a big overland military exercise, but it was like 3,000 miles and it was 80 something days. I knew it had been a big deal. It was called Operation Muskox. And I got into Churchill. The day I arrived, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll do a bit of Googling just in case there's something about it. And it turns out it has its own Wikipedia page and it started in the town of Churchill where I was. Whoa. So, yeah, I know. So then I, I went and I spoke to the mayor of church. And I was like, have you happened to have heard of Operation Muscox? She's like, yeah, everyone knows Operation Muscox. You must speak to the guys at the museum. So I then went to the museum and I spoke <laughs> to the curator. And she went, give me a minute, went into the archives and pulled out photographs of my grandfather <gasps> from 1948. Whoa. Or whatever. It's just absolutely. It was 1946. That was in 1946. So here we, here we were, 72 years later me kind of treading on my grandfather's toes yet again. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Have you yeah. ever uh, have you ever read the book The Golden Compass or that trilogy by Philip Pullman? No, I, it's on my list. So my brothers have and it's so I, I read through children's books in Spanish and uh, I, I'm just coming to the end of the Harry Potter s series. And okay, then yeah, Philip that's Pullman, my favorite. It's that bit more adult, so it will get my, my, my Spanish that much better so I'm, I'm on the philip it's the dark his dark materials trilogy yeah isn't it? So, so so what's interesting yeah. is it's all based up in kind of the northern uh svalbard area and the first one's the golden compass but the second one in the trilogy is called the subtle knife and mm -hmm. it's all about this kid who grows up in the uk and he's only has a single mother because his father went on an exploration up in the northern canadian arctic and never came back and he wants to grow up and be an explorer to follow in his father's footsteps. And it's a little different there because the subtle knife essentially is this knife you can use to cut into alternate universes, which obviously isn't going on. But it's the same thing where he really like wants to 
basically become his father and go into these Canadian Arctic regions and be an explorer just like his dad. So it's like literally kind of your story. <laughs> well, even more than you imagine. So my grandfather was called Patrick and his best friend was Reginald. And Patrick was best man at Reginald's wedding to Gillian. And they had this great party. And then straight after the wedding, Patrick and Reginald went off to the Arctic on a big expedition. And Gillian was left pregnant with her and Reginald's first first child. And my grandfather and his best mate were out on this expedition. And at some point in the expedition, Reginald went missing on a tiny little boat by himself and was never seen again. So just disappeared, never found. Patrick tried to find him, got the main boat to, to go out and try and search for him, but he was never found again. So oh, no. my grandfather had to go back to, to Montreal uh, where Gillian was pregnant with reginald's child mm -hmm. and say listen I'm, I'm terribly sorry that that your husband my best friend has gone missing presumed dead it's my duty as best man to take care of you and your child and so he did so he, he adopted that child who's called handa and then he actually ended up marrying jillian and had four more children the last of which was my mother so actually what? the story is more that's mad. crazy Close yeah oh my yeah. god did you know that have you heard that the books were this oh well your brothers have read them so you... no but they never mentioned this so it's I, I, literally I remember, like it's a... that's the story <laughs> yeah i'm amazed they never mentioned this to me that, that it was basically this kind of mccann family story or, or the other side is the baird family uh, the baird family story i'm amazed it never got mentioned but oh, that's now wild. i'm really forward to reading those books even more and that's a really sad story they never found him never found yeah went missing uh, absolutely terrible obviously um uh, his his daughter Handa is my aunt. We we've grown up as if she was a normal aunt. She's my half aunt, of course, but yeah, um, she's much closer than any of my other relatives. So we've had a lot to do with her and her children. Um, so it's 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 had a, a a nice ending in terms of Handa's life, but obviously a tragedy for Reginald and for Gillian for, for, for losing him. But yeah, crazy story. Yeah, we don't know, but this might be the start of a huge lawsuit. We find out that Philip Pullman just stole your family story and didn't yeah, tell anybody. I'm taking notes. Uh, I'm taking <laughs> what in your parents were involved in conservation too? My dad was the head of seal research for the British Antarctic Survey. So after he did his zoology degree, he got a job with the British Antarctic Survey and went down to Antarctica at a time when your minimum time to spend down there was 33 months in one stint. So, so you were down for 33 months without coming out. And back then, like, just a boat would turn up once every few weeks. Whereas like these days, there's tourist boats there all the time. Right. But this was 1975 to 1978. And boats, Navy boats and that type of stuff would just rock up once every few weeks. So then you'd get all your posts. So we've if your mum had written you a letter and it had missed the post, then then you have to wait another few weeks to get your next letter. Oh. So yeah, pretty mad. Yeah, you, so you, you know how like nowadays, like when you're trying to meet a girl or a, a guy, and like there's the texting thing, and you're like, why aren't they replying to my text? Like we had such a great first date. I'm hoping they get back to me. It's crazy that in the age of technology, you feel that way. Whereas like back in the day, you'd send a letter and you'd be like, I wonder if they actually got that letter or not. And then you don't know if you're being like too needy by sending them a second letter. Whereas like there, it's actually plausible that they didn't get the letter. Whereas in, in today's day and age, they're probably just ignoring your text. They were so much better at delayed gratification back then. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and so how old were you when he was doing this? Did you just not see your dad for like three years? He, I was born in 1981, so he came back from his first trip down south in 78 and then met my mum and I, I came along. And then he, he got the job as the head of SEAL research, so went back multiple times, probably five times between the age of zero and when I was five. And then his, his final trip down was just when I was turning five and my brother Finn, so I've got two brothers, Rory and Finn, and mm -hmm. my youngest Finn was being born and dad decided that now that I was five years old, I was starting school and he now, he now had three boys, um, that he didn't want to be spending six months of the year down in Antarctica. He wanted to try and spend a bit more time with us. So, so, so he, he binned the job with the Antarctic survey and became a biology teacher uh, and tried to just kind of impart his passion for the natural world onto the next generation of kids instead. What was so the was seal race research focused on? Uh, was it like leopard seals down there or the... 
elephant seals. Oh, so his cool. D was on the elephant seal. He, he, he did a lot of work on fur seals as well, but his PhD research was on elephant seals. And it was on like, demographics and the, their response, because they were culled almost down to nothing by the sealers. Like, there were old sealing stations and whaling stations in South Georgia, and they were culled down to almost nothing, fur seals and elephant seals. And Dad was recording their, their return to decent population health and then other aspects of them as well. Yeah, South Georgia in general is an incredible conservation story. And I've talked to a few folks who have gone down there and they said that they're so surprised at how, um, similar to the Galapagos Islands, a lot of the animals seem to not have that inherent fear of humans where differently than the Galapagos Islands, the animals there were really persecuted for a long period of time and it was nothing like it was today. And now it's apparently a wildlife paradise. Sounds unbelievable. My, my brother, Finn, the youngest brother, got to go. So in 2005, my dad got a, a call from an old friend in the Antarctic survey saying, listen, we, we're wanting to do another fur seal survey. The last one was done 20 years ago and you did it. So do you want to come along and do the next one? And dad said, yep, can I bring an assistant? And they said, that's <laughs> And my brother had just finished his, his college and was about to start university, but he had, some, he had a, a year in which to fill. So he spent the first month of that circumnavigating South Georgia by boat and going on shore, doing all the seal counts, jammy bastard. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's some sibling, uh, jealousy there. I would, I would go crazy. Yeah. yeah I'm pretty, pretty gutted about that. Uh, like, so <laughs> South, number one, number one on my list of places I must go before I die. Obviously. Oh yeah. It's the, supposed to be the two probably Baffin islands after, after my grandfather, there's a couple of mountains on there that, that, um, very, very famous and that he climbed for the first time or that he led expeditions that climbed them for the first time. The most famous of which is, is called Mount Asgard. And it became really famous when James Bond skied off the top of it at the start of one of the big James Bond films. And he, he, he so he skis off and pops the parachute. It's the Union Jack parachute. That is Mount Asgard, which was first climbed in 1953 by an expedition led by my grandfather. Whoa, so that's crazy. So you might go back and climb that mountain. Was I wonder if the guy, what came first? Isn't Asgard the place where Saruman rules over uh, the bad part of Lord of the Rings? Asgard's a, a, a Norse, it's a Norse god, I thought. So um, Isengard, are you thinking Isengard? Yeah, oh, maybe it's Isengard. I think it's Isengard. I think there's an Asgard too, though, unless I'm wrong. Uh, As I know I think there's Isengard. Yeah, Anyways, sure we don't need to get into Lord of the Rings folklore here, but... I just I was interested maybe your grandfather had uh, been a huge fan and then named the mountain. <laughs> anyway, I actually got to meet Sir Roger Moore, the, the James Bond who was playing the part in Oh really? In, and I told him that you, that mountain that your stunt double skied off was first climbed by my grandfather and, and he, he loved it. He loved that story. I and know, I could imagine. He said to me, he said, Niall, I, I've always played a hero throughout my life because I look like a hero. But I'm actually a coward, and I'm afraid of everything. <laughs> <laughs> the nicest man. That's awesome. And your mom too. She was. What was her work based on? Yeah, so my mum was kind of a phenomenon as well. Her first expedition was aged fourteen, spending six weeks on Baffin Island as camp cook for an expedition run by my grandfather for the Arctic Institute of, of North America, and then she went overland from London to Delhi in nineteen. 19- 70 age 22 in a truck at a time when women weren't going to those types of parts of the world and all kinds of great stuff became a biologist did research out in kenya and various other places and then when we came along she was 32 when i was born and she then dedicated her time to us really so Mm -hmm. volunteering loads of loads of wildlife sectors here so so volunteering for the national trust and the nature trust and all all these things, but only ever volunteering at time while really focusing on bringing up three young biologists, making sure that we didn't <laughs> and go and become something awful like a banker. Well, I mean, that really does set the, the table for if you and your two siblings are all in conservation and expeditions, what was there ever a decision or was that just something like this is what we're born and bred to do? I, I never thought I'd do anything else, but I, I, there's a specific moment I remember where I kind of announced it to the world that this is what I was going to be. And I was six on a beach in <laughs> North Wales, Red Wolf Bay. 
and I was walking along with my parents and some of my parents' friends who themselves are incredibly eminent professors of, of biology and of conservation. And we found a dead bird, a dead seabird called a razor bill. And I was holding the seabird in my hands and I was just obviously transfixed. And this eminent professor, his name is Nigel Leader Williams, he, he looked down at me and he said, Niall, have you decided what you want to be with your life? Uh, and I looked at him and looked at this razor bill. And I was like, yeah. I think I'm going to be a biologist. <laughs> Probably study birds. Razor bills, most probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, I was telling this kind of eminent professor that that's what I was going to do. And I, I've never studied razor bills. And I've, I've kind of let the side down. But I have oh. become a biologist, so that's no bad thing. I think, I think you'd still be proud. Maybe. I still know him. I'm still in touch with him. So, so, oh, really? So, yeah, 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 yeah. I see that's him every year. funny. So now we've talked enough about uh, the lineage. Let's get into to your story. If you could kind of single out what what has been the most, I don't know, let's start with the most uh, adventurous expedition that you've been on. I mean, I've heard stories of anacondas, snake bites, a lot of this in the, the, the rainforest down in the Amazon. What were you doing down there? What was the purpose of the expedition? Yeah, that was a pretty awesome trip. Um, I've done a, <laughs> done a few trips to the Amazon actually now. Um, the, the, the first... A really seminal trip I did was when I was quite young. I was uh, well, I'd have been 21, just before I turned 22. I was at university still. I was an undergraduate. And I organized an expedition to go to the Bolivian Amazon and Pantanal to study giant otters. And I came up with the idea two and a half years beforehand, just because a friend of mine who was a bit older than me had been to South America and had seen giant otters. And I was like, well, I want to see giant otters. So I... <laughs> I decided I was going to do that two and a half years later. And I, so I put together a team of th three of my mates and we raised some funds and we went out and we spent seven weeks studying these giant otters. And that then, that was the springboard for, for everything that came after that because we'd organized it ourselves. And, and it really, yeah, it, it gave us the confidence to know that we could do this and kind of sets you aside from other people that are doing similar things to you, but maybe not organizing something on such a scale mm -hmm. by themselves. And then one of the guys that came on that trip decided that he wanted to do a PhD on giant otters. Who, who's to blame him? So yeah. a few years, <laughs> absolutely, why not? A few years later, he, he said, well, Niall, I'm, I'm doing a field trip. It's going to be somewhere in Guyana, up in northern South America, next to Venezuela. Do you fancy coming along? And I was like, well, for sure. So we started to do a bit of research about the place that he wanted to go. And it turned out that basically no one had ever been there before. And no one had done any form of biodiversity surveys. So we thought, well, let's let's not just concentrate on giant otters, which is the subject of PhD, but let's let's really look at what else is there. Let's do a full biodiversity survey. It's kind of basic science, but it's but it's really enjoyable. And so we put together this this expedition, and it was six weeks up the Rewa River in canoes, like li living off the land. We took with us all of the kind of staple we need rice and pasta and farines that they dried cassava and then we just collected food from the forest otherwise we, we fished uh, our, our, we took amerindian guides with us and they hunted and we, so we just ate everything from the forest and from the river which is phenomenal and on our way up river we got over these amazing waterfalls that separate the lower rewa river from the rewa head and it's mm -hmm. the headwaters that we've really been to and we got into this area and it's like none of the animals had really seen people before. So, so you're, you're encountering animals that have never seen a primate like you. And so the way they respond is a novel response, which is fascinating. So you oh, see a cool. monk looking at a primate, which looks like it, but not quite the same. And you can see they're like, what is that? <laughs> it <looks> terrible. <laughs> No, I'm just going to throw some feces at it and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> and you're, you're seeing giant otters that have never seen people before. And, of course, and they're very inquisitive. They rear their heads up and they snort and they, 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 they make this whining sound and they come and check you out. Amazing. How big is a giant otter? Like, they're like between six and seven feet long. Just, I've seen some videos of them like going toe to toe with jaguars. Like they'll actually yeah. like... The jaguar will come in and try and I think they're trying to pick off caiman or something in the aisle. I mean, in the river. And for some reason that bothers the giant otters and they can like fend off jaguars. And I'm, you look at the otters that you see around North America and you're like, that'd be easy pickings for a jaguar. 
Uh, the, these guys are these are seriously big otters. So so if if they end up in one of those migrant caravans, you guys have got to watch out. So get that, get that build that before those otters come for you. Those those Latin American otters, they're on a different level altogether. Oh man, oh man. <laughs> yeah, we we got into these this, this these headwaters, and what we were really hoping to see was an anaconda, and suddenly we came around a corner and it was like, well, th there it is. And it was, uh, the, the river was probably about six feet down from, from the bank, so a steep bank, and then it was on top there. So it was at eye height, and we we're looking at this thing, and it was thicker than a tire. And we got up and we met, we, we kind of had a look at it, and we just thought, well, this is, this is just too big. We, we, we can't go anywhere near this, this thing. It's just vast. So we, we went off. Three and a half weeks later, we came back, and it was still there. And in that previous three and a half weeks, we caught a lot of other snakes, loads of boas and loads of racers and stuff. So we were getting quite confident at catching because we were just measuring everything, being as complete as we could mm -hmm. as biologists and get loads of loads of data. And we got back and we were like, well, maybe we could try and catch this. So we, 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 ca we came across it. We drifted down to it. our camp was upstream from it and we drifted down. We were doing a survey that evening like a drift survey just counting all the birds and everything else that we could see and we, we spotted it and um, we thought well we'll come back in the morning if it's still there we'll, we'll try and catch it so we went to bed that night in our hammocks and neither of us could sleep a wink <laughs> we just <laughs> our, our eyes open like this that's terrible <laughs> no idea what happened in the morning like we, we could be eaten in the morning we just don't know <laughs> yeah and i mean the, the horror stories at least in uh, I mean, I remember watching the movie Anaconda when I was a kid and it's like the you're walking through the river and just get dragged under never to be seen again kind of story. So I can understand not wanting to take that capture lightly. For sure. And those stories are real. I, I've met lots of people who have family members who have been taken off the side of a oh, boat. Oh, really? Or I thought it was like folklore. That's... No, 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 no. Anacondas... Once they reach about five meters long, so, so it's like kind of 16 to 17 feet, you are legitimate food. And they will start behaving towards you as if you are a prey item. And it's, it's quite extraordinary when you're in that position, when, when, when an animal's looking at you and it's assessing whether or not it's hungry enough to try and eat you. It's, it's, yeah. it's a strange position to be in psychologically. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And so when, when you're seeing this thing, is it, it just – if it had gone three and a half weeks and was still there and you were comfortable that you could see it in the morning, do they not move particularly frequently or do they have like very strict territorial ranges? Yeah, they are territorial. And in her case, she was shedding her skin. So she, she was out on land, just kind of shedding a bit of skin. She may well have been digesting. Um, but by the, when we, when we, 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 we caught her and we measured her, she, de she didn't have anything solid in her stomach. So she must have finished digesting. But mm -hmm. the, they are territorial. And she was up on the bank facing the sun. So probably just trying to stay nice and warm. Like they can go months without eating, spend hours at a time underneath water. But here she was, huge, great thing. And she's so massive. Like she, she had a 27-inch girth. And she was 18 Whoa. feet and two inches long. <laughs> Yeah, so she'd have been over 100 kilos. And it takes a lot of solar energy to warm that kind of body up. So she was yeah. probably just just basking. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you woke Bloody up awesome the next trap. morning and went oh, for yeah, it? Yeah, woke up the next morning, <laughs> crapping our pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, went down and we went for it. And yeah, so I, I had the head. And of course, her, her head, her mouth opens and she's swinging around <laughs> trying to get you. How many and then people? Else, are, it's just you and one person? Five of us. Five of you. Okay. Yeah. And I reckon we could have got away with four, but any less, and you know it's going to be touch and go. Like, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've caught a 16 foot Burmese python with a 26 and a half inch girth, and that was three of us. And that was, that was yeah, kind of touch and go, especially when it just went all mad and I, I had her. And then another one started coming towards me. Well, I didn't even know <laughs> those got that big. That's like yeah. anaconda size. Yeah, they, they get even bigger. They get up to like seven meters, so 20, 20, 22, 23 oh, wow. feet. They're a huge yeah. problem down here in, in the Florida Everglades because they got introduced in there, and it's like perfect habitat for them. They're just taking over. And I've been, yeah, it's nuts. You, all, all, the only wildlife you see is snakes. Everything else has been eaten. Oh, you've been down there. Yeah, I've catching snakes. I've been down there specifically catching pythons, working oh, really? with the guys that called the, uh, the, the Florida Python Hunters. Oh, wow. Yeah, because the government's putting bounties out. Like, you can get paid to take them out, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. 
It's a weird world, man. It is a weird world. So yeah, U UNO, University of New Orleans is doing a study on them. So everyone that gets gets caught is euthanized uh, humanely and then sent to UNO and they're doing a big ongoing study on it. Oh, interesting. What was the biggest takeaway when you were down there? I mean, how frequently were you finding these things? Is it that easy to find them? Yeah, yeah. Like you, you, you wouldn't go out at night without seeing one, which is pretty mad. Like given yeah. that I spent most of my life desperately looking for snakes uh, and have not seen that many, like the fact that you can you can pretty much guarantee you're going to see a python, if, if not more, on a nightly basis, um, is is pretty extraordinary. Especially as they're they're invasive; they're not meant to be there. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you took these five guys, you, you grab this anaconda, what do you do from there? You're measuring it, trying to get some type of data to, to bring back for the study. Yeah. So there's one person uh, who did his PhD on anacondas. His name is Jesus Rivas. And <laughs> we touched him before we went and he said, yeah, if you can get any data from there, then great. And so we, we were able to, we caught this one and by getting that measurement it also enabled us to have a pretty good rule of thumb measurement for other ones that we saw but weren't able to catch. So, oh, okay, so that's smart. We saw seven anacondas, and and because we had a pretty pretty precise idea of what a what an eighteen foot two inch one looks like, we could then give them a pretty good estimate of the others, which which was really useful. And then I, I've subsequently worked at one of his field sites. I've never met him. We've been in touch, but I've worked at one of his field sites in Los Llanos in Venezuela, and uh, where yeah caught a whole load more. And another one I caught was eighteen feet exactly eighteen feet on the on the nose in a tributary of the Orinoco River in Venezuela. And that, that was three of us as well. And that was, yeah, that was a bit touch and go. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Have you ever had yeah. any sketchy run-ins with the snakes when you're down there? They get bit by they're something. All, they're all a bit sketchy, but no, I, I'm, I'm really careful. And, and I've been handling snakes since I was 15 years old. So I'm, I, I'm quite proficient at it. And I'll only handle a snake that looks handleable. Like you come across some snakes and like people, they're just maniacs. And yeah, you're like, well, yeah. just, <laughs> give that one some birth. I don't, I don't need to pick this fight. I'll leave you to that. I want more of a normal nine to five kind of snake. Like a guy, snake. Yeah. <laughs> guy who gets up and does his thing and isn't too crazy in the meantime. I can, ha I can, I can have a relationship with that kind of guy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So since then, you, you've kind of gone from latin america in your role right now as director of conservation at the national park rescue and yeah. can you talk a little bit about um what your role is there and, and what your kind of day-to-day -day focus is yeah so i think it's, it's probably worth explaining how, how that came about yeah so definitely I, I was doing my phd on on that animal there which is baird's tapir in honduras and that's named after your grandfather well spotted it's not but that's the reason why i did a phd on that tapir because i couldn't resist the opportunity to do a, ta a phd on my grandfather's tapir it just se it seems too perfect not to do I was, so it, I was, was, was it discovered by a different baird yeah so there's a, there's a few beds and this one was named in 1865 and it must have been a family relative of some form but it's not one that's close enough that i can say oh it was like a great great grandfather or something oh, it wow. must be a, a lineage of branch off somewhere i'm slightly sorry i'd love it if it was like a direct uh ancestor of mine yeah um, but that's but it, still super uh, ironic yeah it's amusing enough that i managed to do a phd on on, on my family <laughs> take I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that it, it pleases yeah. me um, so yeah i was in i was in honduras and the data i was discovering basically was demonstrating that, that, that they were dropping off a cliff <clears throat> numbers wise so they, they've been poached to oblivion and one of the reasons that was happening was because of habitat loss but habitat loss only goes so far. Stuff still needs to be shot. And as the, the, the big report that came out last week has demonstrated is that there's many, many things that are causing the loss of our megafauna, but human beings killing them is the main reason. And the, the same goes for the tapirs. And I realized that if I didn't do something, they would disappear in the park where I was working. What would and people kill a tapir for? Because it's 600 pounds of bacon, basically. It's really, oh, really yeah. tasty. They can be eaten. I didn't know that. Yeah, they're they're eaten because they're, they're essentially non-aggressive. They're, they're pretty benign, but they're a huge meat-carrying herbivore, so they're desirable from um, from a hunting perspective. They're super so they're, cute. They're, they're, they're awesome-looking animals. Yeah. yeah, super. 
so you see its penis and that is not cute oh oh no thank you i had that problem down at uh on the pacific coast highway in california you can drive and there's this place called elephant seal beach in for like yeah. three months out of the year a bunch of these elephant seals there go there and i was there with my girlfriend looking and then all of a sudden you start spotting these big red bulges coming out and you're like this is not something not i want to be looking at for much longer <laughs> no no romance is dead uh, <laughs> take a tape it's yeah, it's even worse way worse google saw, it it's worth it i saw a picture of a tape here i don't i the sad thing is i am going to google that but i'm not looking forward to it uh i saw a picture i think it was just yesterday of a tape here swimming underwater i didn't know that they could do that is that uh, all species yeah. that appear? yeah 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 so there's there's four species of tapir um, there's a bunch of scientists trying to claim there's a fifth, but but they're wrong, and the rest of the tapir world <laughs> believes that they're wrong. Uh, why? Why is that? Is it? Is it? They're trying to find like uh, a cryptic one that used to exist, or it's a? They think it exists currently. No, they think it exists currently, and that it's smaller than uh, than the other ta- the other tapir that lives in Amazonia, which is the, the the Brazilian tapir. They think it's a smaller version of that, but that assertion has been challenged robustly by genetics and morphology um, by the by the tapir world and it oh, caused a rift, caused caused a major rift in the tapir specialist group and yeah tapir fights are not pretty what what are the <laughs> i'm just picturing that uh what are the, what are the four types there's the beards the malayan and then what are the there's other the two? mountain tapir mountain tapir uh, tapirus pinchakwe which lives in the andes small it's got black fur and white lips amazing looking things Whoa. and then there's, yeah stunning looking things and then there's the amazonian tapir or the brazilian tapir which ha- has a mohawk and is otherwise relatively dully co- colored um it's kind of like brown gray color but mohawk and um yeah similar size to beds a little bit smaller um, and they're doing pretty well like the, the amazon despite the best efforts of uh, brazil's government uh, <laughs> is still huge yeah and that means that there's, st- there's a huge amount of land still available for, for uh, the Amazonian tapir. So they're doing well, whereas the other three species are all either endangered or critically endangered. So not doing so well at all. Oh, that's, that's not good. Especially because I read a fact, I think it was last week, that the Amazon rainforest supplies 70% or some crazy amount of the world's oxygen. So we should probably get on protecting that a little bit quicker than we are. Uh, yeah, we, we need that forest. It's then, kind of then important. New, a new president is not a progressive man. <laughs> so yeah, it's a worrying situation. So you were going and what was the, the PhD specific focus on with, within the Baird's tape? I can, it, is it tapir or tapir? I never pronounce it. Is there I, a I preferred one? Judge you, I won't judge you either way. I think um, I've so, said uh, each one like 12 times in the last three minutes. So let's hope that pronounce, works. I pronounce it tapir, but in Spanish it's tapir uh, or danto. Um, so... I'm 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 bilingual, so let's go for either. Um, I'm going to go with Danto. I like that. Danto, El Danto. So I was studying El Danto, and th- what I was looking at was the conservation status of that species in in Honduras. Okay. And as I said, the conservation status was terrible. So they were doing really badly. They were being killed at a terrible rate, dropping off a cliff. And I managed to arrange for a meeting with the Minister for Environment of Honduras. And I showed him the data of what was happening to the tapirs. Uh, and he was like, oh, well, that's bad. But I knew he wouldn't do much. But what I was also able to show him was that marijuana was being grown inside this national park that I was researching where they were going badly extinct, where the tapirs were going extinct. And he did care about the marijuana. So I convinced him to mobilize the army and the environmental prosecution service. And they then started patrolling that national park for the next couple of years. On the back of that, I then set up a community ranger program. And for the last six years, me and a Honduran colleague of mine from the organization Panthera called Franklin Castaneda. Franklin and I have been running these community patrols uh, for six years. And the guys have been patrolling the park and looking out for illegal information and feeding that information back to the police and the environmental prosecution service so that that can be acted upon. And because I had done that, I was put in touch with someone that was trying to do something relatively similar in Malawi, so trying to protect a national park in Malawi by getting the government to authorize the army to come in and Mm -hmm. uh, take this park that was just being devastated by poaching. And this guy, Mark Hiley, and I 
Um, we, we, we met in Paddington Station in London. I wore a pink carnation so he could recognize me. And uh, <laughs> we, got really, uh, we got on really well. And three years later, we set up National Park Rescue, which is an organization that aims to identify those national parks in Africa at the, for the time being that cannot cope with the poaching crisis and then going to try and save them. Okay, so now that I understand that bridge, I want to put a pause button on because we talked about a lot of things I want to go into before National Park Rescue, and it just shows how I jumped too quickly into that next topic. So you found marijuana and basically yeah. used that to say, hey, there's some drug cartel, certain like illegal activities going on in here, so why don't you deploy the army? But at the same time, while you're doing that, let's focus on these illegal deforestation and, and poaching going on? Is that basically what that conversation was? Yeah, essentially. It was the first time I'd ever presented anything in Spanish. It was to the minister. I had my tapiographs and my marijuana photographs, uh, and, and I tried to put the link between the two, and, and he agreed. So he literally got on the phone then, while I was with him, to the minister for defense and and authorized the military to go in, which, which, which was, a, it was, a, it was a positive result. That, that was for sure. To have that kind of impact straight away uh, was a positive result. I, Honduras is dependent upon trade and to a lesser extent aid with the US and the, the DEA would be unthrilled to discover that the government hadn't responded to evidence that marijuana was being grown inside a national park. Even if it was on a small scale as it was, this was not a commercial scale. It was the fact that it was there, I knew I had leverage. Have you ever thought of using that as a conservation tactic in other national parks, just like bring some pot <laughs> seeds with you, plant some pot and, um, and just keep I, <laughs> going. I mean, it would be, it'd be a great movie. I'll go 50, 50 on revenue with you, man. If uh, <laughs> we'll do this together. You're like the Johnny Appleseed of uh, Latin American national parks, just spraying pot seeds instead of apple seeds. It's a great idea. <laughs> you heard it here first. So when that Nobel <laughs> prize comes out, Bring it to the Escape the Zoo podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Have you heard? Uh, so we were introduced through Jeremy Hance, who's been on the podcast, and he just did a story a couple of weeks ago about how they're thinking of reintroducing the tapir to Borneo, but it's kind of a controversial topic. Have you looked into that at all? Do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, of course. So it came up. At the uh, International Tapir Symposium that I was at, uh, <laughs> did you get your invitation? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was there with my my pink carnation on too. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I miss you. Um, so it's been discussed within uh, tapir aficionado circles for, for a little while, and of course, just the general Borneo, Borneo conservation community. And there are very good reasons to bring them back, conservation reasons. I, I, I love the idea of rewilding. I, I'm all for rewilding. I believe that the United Kingdom needs to get on and, and start rewilding our national parks. And our, uh, we don't have many protected areas, but we, we don't have much wilderness, but we need to, we need to rewild it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think releasing tapers would be a very interesting idea as well. Um, just because they should be there. And it's our fault that they're not. And it is deeply frustrating the, the way that we have shifting baseline syndrome. And we're like, well, okay, so this is what it's like now. So let's just try and keep it what it was now. But now is terrible in comparison to what things were like 30 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago. And we have to remember that the world was extraordinarily diverse. And the mm -hmm. biggest thing that's been lost is not, is not diversity, it's abundance. So it, it, you've, yes, we've lost tapir from from, from Borneo, but we've lost an unbelievable abundance of things. And, right. and that's the shock. Is, well, yeah. And it also, that assumption of like, oh, well, let's try and protect what we have now assumes that things are at a, a baseline level that are kind of at a fixed level. Whereas ultimately, like it's diminishing. It's not, I mean, stable. That's the best word. It's not, it hasn't stabilized. It's just that we're at this point in time and things are continuing to decrease at an incredibly high rate and rewilding is something that can help stop that. It's not like we're in this perfectly stable environment and why would we ever rewild and touch it because things are great the way they are, you know? No. And one of the strong arguments that people try to use against rewilding is that, well, really we should be expending those resources on protecting what we have. But, but what that, what that doesn't recognize is that, Resources are not fixed. There's not a single pot of resources that all conservation programs are dipping into. 
Rewilding touches buttons that protecting the status quo does not touch. So you can get so much more funding for something like a rewilding project than you could possibly get for a, a forest protection project. And the same goes for why I, I don't disagree with elephant orphanages. Uh, really, an elephant orphanage costing $100,000 or whatever it is to, to, to keep a couple of elephants alive every single year is not a good use of conservation money. But it's not conservation money. It's an orphanage money. That, mo that money would not be spent on something conserving elephants in the wild if it wasn't being spent there. They, they, they're two separate things because they touch different buttons. And yeah, so I and think they, they're I'm also like have different funding vessels too. Like I look at something uh, like I'm working on a documentary on the overpopulation of feral cats in Hawaii right now. And one of the solutions they have is they have this cat sanctuary where on the very small island of Lanai, because there's a few thousand of them, not hundreds of thousands of them like there's on, on Oahu, every time they're trapped, instead of sterilizing them and letting them back in the wild or humanely euthanizing them, they put them into this um, sanctuary where they live out the rest of their lives. But it's completely funded by tourists who go and they visit and some adopt them. But most of the time they're going, they're playing with 600 cats. It's kind of a fun, wacky yeah. environment. But they're throwing 10 bucks here or there. But there's so many people who come in and out that they're coming and visiting. And it's not like that $10 is going to be going towards other conservation efforts if that tourist didn't end up going there. And I think the same thing about the elephant orphanages. Like every time somebody goes to the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust or Reteti in Kenya, like they're donating, they're paying to be there. And it's it's somewhat of an eco-tourist attraction. And, it's n and those are dollars that are being diverted from just general consumer spending, not other, yeah, uh, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, so it's not, yeah. I, I think it's unfortunate when people think of it as like, it's one or the other, cause it's certainly not. Yeah, completely agree. So go tape is in Borneo. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I mean, I think that's cool too. And there's also the side of it too, where you start looking at the other species that could potentially predate on the Borneo tape to peer. And that helps with, the smaller populations of there's still tigers in Borneo, right? Like tigers that would hunt them and other things like that. So anyways, so you do that, you get the national park rescue, you start this. And then what is the, where are you at now? What is the goal of the national park rescue? The goal for us at the moment is to resuscitate Chisarira national park in Zimbabwe where, where we're working. So, mm -hmm. so we've got this national park, it's a beautiful national park. Absolutely stunning, but it's been poached to oblivion. So it used to have the highest density of black rhinos anywhere in Southern Africa. It had about 300 black rhinos in a 2,000 square kilometer park. And they were all killed in a killing spree between 1989 and 1994. And then since 2006, the park has lost around 3,000 elephants and similar numbers of buffalo and masses of other plains game and the lion population has been affected and everything. So, so the park, when we arrived there a year ago, and started working a year ago was on its knees you could the infrastructure was in pieces the rangers had no functioning vehicles they were poorly paid and poorly motivated and poorly trained the communities were completely hostile to the to the park uh, they absolutely see the park as the enemy and the wildlife was what wildlife was left was hugely skittish so there was hardly any wildlife anywhere and the second it saw a vehicle or a person, it just took for the hills. And in the last year that we've been working there, we've completely overhauled everything, really. The infrastructure is now functioning very, very well. The rangers are properly trained and motivated and, and recompensed for their work. The communities no longer see the park as the enemy because we're employing them. We're, um, we've started commercial enterprises between the park and the communities, and we're generating tourism. And most importantly, the wildlife is coming back. The wildlife is no longer terrified. And in the year that we've been there, not one elephant has been killed on our watch. Wow. Well, so that's the biggest. That's huge. Spot. Is it, is it militarized the in the sense that I, is it heavily armed? Is that what's stopping the elephant poaching? I'd say the whole program is stopping elephant poaching. Inevitably, you have to get the law enforcement right. The poaching and the illegal wildlife trade is a law enforcement problem. So the fact that it's been addressed by biologists for the last 60 years, it's really no surprise that, it is, that that 
conservation effort has failed because what do biologists know about law enforcement in the same way yeah. what do botanists know about policing the global narcotics trade botanists are not the people to ask about how to police global narcotics yeah. biologists are not the people to ask about how to police the global wildlife trade program so I, my job now is I, I'm no longer a biologist really I, I, I'm, I'm a director of conservation but my, my conservation work is essentially law enforcement work and we must get that law enforcement right so that that, that park is seen as a hard target that people don't want to bother with. A poacher is going to look at that park and go, I don't fancy my chances in there, so I'm going to try the soft target around the corner. So we've got to get that right. But key to everything is engaging the communities and integrating the communities. And we do that by creating a functioning microeconomy between the park and the communities so that the communities see the park as an asset to be protected as opposed to something that is purely a detriment to their lives. So we do that through employment, we do that through commerce. So we, we, we feed the rangers with food we buy from the communities. Mm -hmm. So we buy meat and we, we gave them vegetable seeds, they grow the vegetables, we buy that back, we feed the rangers and we encourage community focused tourism. So, so suddenly the community's livelihoods are dependent upon the success of the conservation operation. And when you interlink those and you create an interdependence between the functioning of the park and the prosperity of the communities, you have the communities acting as your first line of defense. They let us know when something's going down and we can then respond to that. Because then they get the intel if somebody, if a large poaching ring wants to come in and hire some people within the community and the guy who gets asked to do that, his three brothers and a couple sisters are hired by the park, he's going to let somebody know. Instantly. So what I, I get how the park can be beneficial to kind of creating that symbiotic relationship with the community. What I don't understand is how would it ever be detrimental? Like before you guys went in, they viewed it as um, a hindrance or an interference or something negative. How, what is what is causing that? Two, yeah, the, the two the two two main reasons are that a national park has complete protected status in Zimbabwe. So nothing can be hunted there. There's different levels of protection for different levels of um, of uh, landscape. So, so a national park is 100% protected, which means that if a member of the community wants to go and hunt a buffalo because it's Christmas or just because he's hungry and he goes into the park and he kills it, then he will be arrested for that. And if you if you're killing, if you're caught with ivory, pangolin scales, then that's nine years in jail. And no one wants to spend nine years in, in a Zimbabwean jail. So they see it as a detriment to them because they can't go and hunt in there for fear of being incarcerated or beaten or generally maltreated by, by the park rangers. So that's reason number one is they can't just go hunt there uh, because it's illegal. Reason number two is that the people in the communities surrounding our park have a specific enmity with the government because they were forcibly removed from their former homes when Lake Kariba was created. Mm. The Zambezi was flooded, that Kariba Valley was, 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 was Zambezi was down, Kariba Valley was, Valley was flooded, and those communities were forced out of there and they were rehoused, and they were rehoused next to this park. And so government forced them out of their homes, they, go, they don't like government. National Park is seen as government, therefore there's an inherent enmity between the park and the communities because of that. That makes sense. And so when you look at the the law enforcement side of things, so now what does that look like? Is is the law enforcement creating that symbiotic relationship so you get better intel and or is that kind of one spoke in the bigger wheel is what I would guess. Yeah, it's one spoke. Law, law enforcement's critical. You've got to get it right, but it's it is just one spoke. But you can in integrate the communities in that not just as as informers that are literally financially recompensed for providing information to us, but as community scouts as well. So you, you can hire community members to patrol either the communal lands or in the park, depending on how much leeway you get from the parks authority. And then you've, you've literally got a team of local guys on your law enforcement team. And they know the land better than anyone else. They have all the local intel. They are incredibly fit. They can survive in these areas amazingly well. And, and, and they are the best way to, to protect your national park is, is by hiring local people. What you have to understand is that in, in, in any community, in rural Zimbabwe or in California or in Cardiff, there's a criminal element. There is right. an element 
there's a proportion of the population who will seek to earn their living through illicit means. And over here, that means robbing people's houses or stealing cars or whatever it is. Over in Zimbabwe, it, it, it can be robbing people's houses or it can be poaching. You're poaching to then sell meat on the illegal market or you're selling ivory into the Chinese or mm -hmm. you're selling pangolin scales to China. But there's that criminal element that will always need policing. What we have to do is make sure that the rest of the community likes us and is on side because we need them to be able to help police that criminal element. In the same way as any, any police force in any city anywhere in the world needs to do that groundwork on the community to make sure that it's much easier to, to police that criminal element that will always be doing bad things. Right. I've talked to folks who have spent time in Kenya, Botswana, yourself in Zimbabwe, and there's so much of, I think in general, like it's very well understood, or at least for the folks who are involved in it, that you really can't take that Western mentality of like, how could anybody hurt these animals? Like, they're so beautiful. Like, like no. yeah, exactly. Like you really need to understand at a grassroots level and a community-based level what's going on in these parks and, and really understand the specific nuances of those communities to really be able to um, effectively implement uh, protection means and in, in protocols and processes. But what's interesting is you see from Kenya to Botswana to Zimbabwe, there's all very different ways at which they go and approach doing that, whether it be um, like the heavily armed military guards, whether it be um, a more of a reliance on that community intel, whether that be trying to get conservation money in through trophy hunting or something to that extent, um, or whether it be completely banning trophy hunting, et cetera. Is there a collective effort anywhere going on that's really making case studies of all these different approaches in trying to open source it in a way that other parks could implement these processes as well? Or is it something where Zimbabwe is just inherently way different than even uh, a country 200 miles north or Botswana or Kenya, and that it's really not helpful to, to look at what those other groups are doing? Yeah, a really good question, but it, it really is helpful. A every situation is, is unique, of course. So, so the, the unique dynamics of those local communities will determine how you police your park. But there are some rules of thumb that you can follow pretty well that could be shared more or less across the landscape. And there is not yet a sufficient amount of cooperation between conservation organizations. Uh, traditionally, they compete. They think they compete for funding. They definitely compete for interest, for followers. And, and that's, that's just a negative mentality. There needs to be a much more of, a, of an open source mentality. And it, it's beginning. So there are a few organizations, ourselves included, that, that are highly collaborative in nature and want to share ideas. We, we, we've had great successes where we are. We want people to know about that. We don't want to be like, well, no, this is our IP. We're going to hold on to this and not let anyone know. We're like, no, like, this, this is yeah. our blueprint. Go for your life. Use this. This, is, this works, guys. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, and it's like and if like, it's public funding, it should be public information. And I, it, it, that drives me crazy. I, I started a nonprofit in Boston where we uh, retrofit school buses to be mobile grocery stores that travel to underserved Boston communities, help with food access, et cetera. And it would drive me nuts how you would go and try and interact with certain more well-established, because we were really an entrepreneurial nonprofit, and we'd go to some of these groups that have been established in Boston for 10, 20, 30 years, and how pure competition they viewed us as. I was like, this is not the way that we should be working. Uh, I mean, ultimately, like the same community is funding both of our works, and we really just want to be solving this problem. Why aren't we collaborating on that front. So it's always disheartening to hear, but I'm glad to hear that that's um, kind of shifting. And at least- Yeah, there yeah. are still lots of, lots of problems. There's a lot of inertia in that big NGO sector and a, a very much a lack of uh, collaboration. And that, that needs to change. That really needs to change. And I'm working on making it change. And there are lots of other organizations that are also working, making it change. And it's, I think over the next few years, we'll start to see um, a lot more cooperative programs. Now, you're, you're starting to see organizations like National Geographic teaming up with African parks mm -hmm. to protect national park. And, and the, these kind of multi-sector 
collaborations are very, very interesting and something that I'm interested in pursuing as well and seeing how organizations that aren't traditionally conservation organizations or law enforcement organizations can bring their areas of expertise to, to maximize your ability to, 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 to keep a park thriving. Because a park doesn't just need a bunch of guys with guns taking care of it. It does need that, but it needs so much more to really thrive. And you get experts from the tourism sector or from finance or wherever, to pull, pull, put your heads together. Suddenly you can start having a much more holistic view of how mm. to make parks thrive. They always use that example, right? If there's a, for some reason you're seeing a river going down and there's a bunch of babies and they're floating down the river and they're headed towards a waterfall and they're going to go down to their death. Obviously, it's very important for somebody to be at the top of that waterfall grabbing people and catching them. And that's the way that I view like the military guns, like they're like the militarized units that are stopping poachers are really the people that are just stopping it at the kind of inflection point where things go really badly. But ultimately, the end goal is to really be upstream, finding out who's dumping all these babies into the river. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and I think you just can't assume that one one of those methods is really going to solve it. You have to figure out the whole, what's the whole system that's going into play here? What are your thoughts in general on, uh, sorry, I'm just like thinking about, I should be able to say that in a better way than thinking about babies plummeting down a waterfall. Oh, it's a great it's, analogy. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, also, just, it's just such a sad, like I, I could do anything. Like I just might use like puppies or something going forward. It's just really sad to think of babies. <laughs> But we're, politically, uh, at the moment, the United Kingdom is like a load of babies hurtling towards the edge of a waterfall. And there's one or two people standing on the edge saying, no, don't do this terrible thing you think of doing. But but looks like uh, looks like we might be doing it. Go Brexit. Yeah, oh, I get my yeah yikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you uh, what are your general thoughts and there's just those two kind of more cliche controversial conservation efforts in in Africa one being trophy hunting and the other being like John Hume and his farming of rhino horn from protected rhinos um just interested yep. to hear your thoughts on both of those so i've met john hume um actually for listeners who haven't heard the other episodes of the podcast where we discussed this can you kind of explain John Hume's situation real quickly. John Hume is a hugely wealthy real estate developer who at some point in his adult life decided to shift out of real estate and go into farming. But unlike most people that invest in farming, he decided to invest in white rhinos. He's a South African businessman and he has developed a breeding stock of white rhinos. So he now has a population of well over a thousand and he harvests their horn. You, a rhino grows a couple of pounds worth of horn every single year. And if you think at the moment in, in China on the black market, uh, two pounds of rhino horn goes for in the region of $50,000. So he's yeah. harvesting about $50,000 per year per rhino and he's got about 1,200 of them. So he has an enormous bank vault of product that is at varying levels of legal to trade or not to trade, uh, to, to, depending on what the South African Minister for Environment is saying from one week to the next. So John Hume believes that this is the best way to save rhinos, is that uh, if you turn them into a domestic animal and then you can breed them sustainably, you can then fund the protection of them in the wild. What John Hume fails to realize is that uh, by creating a legal market, as he is doing, you then create an enormous amount of space for a black market to function underneath it. And that black market will undercut price. And the black market rhino horn will be sourced from places that cannot protect them as well, places like national parks. And in the time that John Hume has been trying to do all this, South African national parks are losing rhinos at an extraordinary rate. We lost over 1,300 rhinos in 2013 and about 1,100 last year. So we're losing terrible numbers. John Hume's idea would be fine in principle if people would only guarantee buying their rhino horn from sustainable sources. But that's not how black markets work. It's not how 
criminal minds work. They won't do that. They will undercut it. So all he is doing is encouraging a market that needs to be stopped. Now, really, the best way to stop rhinos getting killed is for the Chinese to stop using rhino horn. And if you have any form of legal market, they're going to carry on thinking it's OK. In the UK, it was totally cool for people to have an elephant foot hat stand or umbrella stand and to walk around wearing fur and all these things about 50 years ago. And now that is completely taboo. No one has their gorilla hand ashtray anymore right. because, because it is uncool. It is it's illegal, but it is also massively taboo. And this is the same process we have to go through with Southeast Asian nations that have got extraordinarily wealthy very recently and have a lot of disposable income that they want to spend on things that make them look rich, things like rhino horn and ivory and pangolin scales. And it needs to get to that level of taboo within particularly Chinese, but other South, Southeast Asian nations as well, within their societies, that no one wants to have rhino horn because it's as bad as us having a gorilla hand ashtray. It's basically the equivalent. So John Hume, I've met the man, and he happens to be unpleasant. But, but, but oh, really? putting, the, putting the personality to one side, I don't agree with his, his idea because it doesn't exist in the real world. It, it exists in a theoretical model of ideal economics, mm. which fails to recognize the way humanity actually functions. Well, so there's, the, there's I, a piece of that too, where you could see how it would have a little bit more basis if Rhino Horn was genuinely something that was helpful to the world. Like if, no. if for... If for some reason, and, and I still wouldn't agree with what he's doing, but if you were operating in a world where Rhino Horn actually did have these crazy medicinal values or something like that, and it was benefiting people who were sick, like maybe there is a place for something like that, but it would be heavily regulated or something to that effect, but there's not. And I think the bigger problem is that we need to be educating around the world that there is zero benefit to anybody having a Rhino Horn. You might as well eat your own fingernails. And yeah. to, to do anything to encourage that being a market, I, I agree with everything else that you said, but I think I'm just doubling on top of it because it's an absolutely worthless item that has this huge price tag. Um, but it's but interesting that the majority of the use isn't actually medicinal. So, so the medicinal use of rhino horn is, 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 is small in comparison to the status of having rhino horn. So if you come to visit me uh, in my house and I want to show off how wealthy I am, I'll grate some rhino horn into your gin and tonic when you come in. It's, it's a status symbol of how wealthy you are. And at the moment when you've got these Southeast Asian nations with a massively expanding middle class that are wanting to demonstrate their disposable income, that's one of the ways that they're doing it. Yeah, and I think what leaves me a little optimistic, though, and I was talking to Amy Vitali about this yesterday, actually. Um, she was saying how... It can be dangerous to to look at um, certain Asian areas like China or something as a collective, right? And using like the they, China, like uh, and almost demonizing them in the sense that like it's really kind of encouraging the education and coming to the table and making it taboo exactly like what you were saying. And what's encouraging to me is something like shark fin soup, whereas shark fin soup is something that I understand if I grew up in a culture where it, I just never knew that there was an environmental danger to it. And when I went out to dinner, my parents got shark fin soup. I ate shark fin soup, didn't think twice about it. What was really encouraging to me is Yao Ming did that uh, commercial with Wild Aid. And I think within a year, it dropped off like 80%. So I think sometimes it can seem so insurmountable to make these things taboo and to educate people. And I just, I don't think that it's, it comes from a place of apathy in these Asian nations. I think lo a lot of it is just kind of explaining in, in making it really a poor decision to be doing these things and understanding why it's not a good thing and using these very powerful celebrities like a Yao Ming to, to create that culture shift, you know? Really? I've heard people say, oh, it's okay. My ivory is sustainably sourced because they genuinely don't realize that that's not a thing. So yeah. people are Ming and Jackie Chan who are really trying to do this. This is vital uh, and yeah, more power to them and, and Wild Aid for doing what they've done. They're, they're making big inroads.
Yeah, and I also think people need to stop making that distinction about antique ivory versus regular ivory. Like it's still it's like the same thing. And if it, if you it's the same part is if you have sustainably sourced rhino horn, there's still going to be a black market. If you have antique ivory, there's still going to be people who are faking fresh ivory to be antique ivory. And I wonder like what the the solution, like it would be so smart for a government to say, I'm banning ivory completely, but I'll buy up the antique ivory because I know you guys have some value in these things. And Um, say that again. It's like an amnesty, like a gun amnesty, but yeah, like turn them in like, like, I mean, even the U.S., I mean, Trump just said that you could go in and uh, there's certain African countries that were allowing the import of ivory again. And it's like, when was the last time that it's just despicable to me? But yeah, I don't know. I'm going down a rabbit hole. I'm trying to rein it back in here. But uh, I agree with you on the John Hume front. I would happily happily riff on ivory for, for, for a long time and the trade because the U.K. has just passed very, very restrictive legislation. The U.S. has some quite restrictive legislation on uh, on the trade of ivory outside of trophies. But then that leads on to your question about trophy hunting and the place of trophy hunting yeah. in conservation. This is very interesting because um, obviously I hate trophy hunting because what kind of dick wants to shoot an elephant? <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But, and the big but is that at the moment in Southern Africa, an area the size of France and Spain combined is set aside solely for hunting purposes. And if that wasn't used for hunting, we could not protect it any better. It could not just become national parks because national parks are too expensive. So that, that, that land would be shifted across to agriculture, which would be absolutely disastrous. So in terms of a land use, for the moment, hunting has a place. It, do, it had, Morally, it has no place in the 21st century. But in terms of a land use, until we found a way of protecting that land through means that aren't consumptive, it, it's, an, it's a necessary evil across the Southern African landscape. Not in places like the US, but in Southern Africa, absolutely. Yeah, but what does need to stop is the... <laughs> I agree. Like I, I go back and forth because I've had people that I respect on both sides of the argument that have taught me both uh, explanations. To me, I almost look at it and I would have to look at it empirically and scientifically and see like case studies of how it's actually playing out just because I've had so many people who I respect on both sides tell me different answers. But the one thing that needs to stop is the posing with the animal. That's what drives me nuts is not only it's like how horrific could it be to actually go and shoot an elephant, but then to like, sit next to it and like point your finger to the sky and have a big smile on your face table in one hand and your gun in the other it's like me and jesus together we we shot this lion yeah it's like (laughs) it just like i don't know as a as a spiritual man myself i don't know how you can kind of combine the two in one photo like that's a that's a particular have you rationalized your spirituality with what you're doing there? <laughs> yeah, but but that's people a... talk about it in spiritual terms. This is the thing. that they, they, they talk about it as being like a religious experience where they have got closer to the animal because of what they've gone through. So, so it, it's, I, 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 I wasn't being flippant in, in saying that because this is genuinely how people, how people view their hunt is some kind of spiritual experience, which is obviously madness for someone like yourself. But, yeah. but for them, that's how they see it. And, and I'm also... I... I'm, I think hunting particularly, I'm not talking about endangered species hunting, but hunting in general has a really big place in conservation. And I think a lot of hunters, particularly in America, who are doing it sustainably in deer populations, elk populations, do more for conservation than your average person who's buying beef at the local grocery store. So I'm not anti-hunting by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I was going to go, I'm pretty anti-gun, but we can get into that later. But uh, <laughs> so like, if you're going to do it, use a bow, I think is a little better. But my point is, is it's just, it, there's that, um, the spirituality side of things. When you talk to hunters, a lot of it is, they have that connection with nature because they go on these three, four, five day hikes up in Wyoming, Montana to find these deer and take down an animal and then feed their family for two or three weeks. And I can get down with that. But a lot of these people who have these spiritual, quote unquote, spiritual experiences in Africa, it's because some guy threw a hunk of meat in a tree and let the nose of lions in the area and then 
calls him, wakes him up at three in the morning. Is like, hey, if you come outside, you can kill this animal in the next ten minutes. It's not a particularly uh, no a impressive McDonald's endeavor. Card, you basically just have to pull the trigger. It's yeah, yeah it, it's contemptible. But and I caveat that again, until we can come up with a a better way of protecting that enormous amount of land. It still has a place in in that Southern Africa conservation yeah, and, context. Yeah, and and that's what I I always appreciate when it's so easy to sometimes just take the more compassionate answer, right? And you're like, I it's terrible. Like trophy hunting's horrible. But ultimately, I'd like to keep myself open to any option that ultimately forwards the progression that we need. And maybe it's an interim step into ultimately fencing that off and getting the funds to actually protect that area and not make it agriculture or something to that effect. Um, but I saw that your, your organization has a documentary coming out, right? Is, does this go detail into some of those specific actions or what is it about? We're, we're having to be quite careful about what we show and what we don't. So what we would like to demonstrate and we won't be releasing this anytime soon and we will, we will think very carefully before we do. We have a huge amount of footage. And what we would like to do is demonstrate how conservation should be doing a lot better than it is. Mm -hmm. And the conservation world has ostensibly failed because we're still losing 20 or 30,000 elephants a year, which is insanity. We're, lion populations are down 46% in the last 25 years. Like, conservation is failing. And it is failing on the watch of big guys like WWF who have been making extraordinary sums of money telling people that they're saving the planet when they are not. And yet the solutions for how to save the planet are out there. And it's, it's like our focus is poaching. But the same thing goes for renewable technologies or anything. So when you get... A, a program like Cowspiracy, a documentary like Cowspiracy, that just blows the lid off the fact that so many of these big organizations are just keeping shtum about the disaster of commercially raised beef. Mm -hmm. And Greenpeace won't talk about it. And all these other people won't talk about it. And it's the same with conservation. WWF have been tacitly supporting the trade in ivory for the last 30 or 40 years. Wait, what? WWF have been supporting the ivory trade at CITES. Uh, and then, so, so that's just on one level. Then you get, let's, let's look at something specific. So they'll go into a place, again, they'll go into Zimbabwe, somewhere that I know very well, and they will donate a helicopter. But then they do nothing with that. They, they just donate it. They hand it over. That helicopter, I know, is being used to round up the baby elephants that the government of Zimbabwe are selling to Chinese zoos. So WWF's helicopter is being used to catch baby elephants to sell to the Chinese. Or they'll donate six sniffer dogs, but they don't donate any food. And so those sniffer dogs starve to death because the rangers can't afford to feed them. So there's, there's so many things happening that are just so ridiculous. And we're, we're, we have to be careful how we blow the lid off this because conservation is necessary. WWF are necessary. And the world is a better place because they're in it, but it could just be so much better if they were good at their job. Yeah, because... Um, so I get the helicopter, I get the dogs. Like That could just be like a, a lack of follow-through on something that seems like a good idea. But I don't get why would they ever support the ivory trade? And is that like, is that behind closed doors, or is that like just blatantly like they're voting improperly? No, you, you, you can you can Google it. They've even been they've been open about their support of the of the ivory trade for why? a long time. Like, what? How would that make any sense? Because they would be kicked out of Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa, and probably Botswana if they didn't. And so they're playing that political game. They're like, well, we, well we're going to support this. That's, that's my guess. That's my guess that it's to do with that. Or, because I, I don't think they believe that having an ivory trade is, is better for elephants. <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, you got to figure it doesn't come from a place of malevolence. It has to be trying to game the system in some way or another, right? Or like just play the long game. 
it's almost like well, what we're talking about, like trophy hunting, right? It's you have it's the lesser of two evils at a certain point in time. Or do they just need to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. What you are doing there is wrong. And that's yeah. what I think they should be doing, really. Yeah. Jeez. That's disheartening. I had no idea. So that's what the documentary is about. Well, we're having to make a decision. Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> this that's a pretty big lid to blow off and all, yeah. all this type of stuff. And just when you go to a national park and you see all the things that are, that are happening there that are just failing, like, like, just, just terrible, terrible aspects of management terrible oversight whereas really just with some sensible planning and a little bit of on the ground oversight we could turn the situation around yeah and that, i mean so, that's where i was getting at when i was talking about open sourcing a lot of these success stories as you look at something like wwf and what's disheartening about that is to me that's always like that's the ivory tower of uh conservation in the sense that you would like to think that if i don't know where to put any of my money i might as well give it to them because they know what they're doing and if the largest bureaucratic nonprofit is doing things like that in wildlife, uh, there just needs to be more transparency around what's actually going on with this stuff. Completely. So when, when I decided that our organization was going to go into Chisarira National Park in Zimbabwe, because I'd done a lot of research about all 230 something national parks in Africa that have elephants, 37 countries and 200 and something national parks. And I looked at, the trajectories and uh, of what was happening. And, and I was trying to identify those parts that are not coping. And when I was doing that, you can also, with a bit of digging, find out which organizations are in charge of those national parks that aren't doing so well. And you see the same guys coming up every time that are taking care of national parks that are failing. And either that's a coincidence or they're just really not very good at their jobs. And then you, you so you scratch around and you can find some amazing examples. Like you've got African parks, an organization that were only set up about under 20 years ago, and they are doing unbelievable work everywhere. They are absolutely phenomenal. Give your money to them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And there are so many other smaller organizations that are doing really, really impressive work out there. It, it just it takes a little bit of digging. And of course, I, the average person isn't going to do that. They're not, they're not going to go and look at the trajectories of elephant populations in 230 national parks and find out who's doing it wrong. I had the time to do that. And it's, it's amazing how much that's opened my eyes. You know, it all comes back to me to something that really resonated with me that you said earlier, which was you're a biologist, but a lot of the problems that you're solving now have to do with law enforcement. And a lot of times all of conservation as a whole has been tackled by biologists and they definitely, it shouldn't necessarily be that way. And I was talking to Christina Mittemeyer about uh, a very similar thing where she said, uh, what we're really trying to do is use storytelling as a vehicle to get people to care about these animals in the first place and then lend that lead them towards resources and petitions uh, and fundraising efforts to really begin to help the conservation and then give the money to the biologists who know what they're doing. And I think inherently what I found really interesting is you're a biologist that has become a law enforcer. She's a biologist who's become a photographer and a filmmaker Whereas in all reality, what we need to do is start looking at conservation more broadly and be like, the biologists should be looking at the science of this. But we need mm -hmm. law enforcement people. We need filmmakers. We need everybody that's part of this general ecosystem that can help to, to get in there. Uh, even people in commerce, like you were mentioning with the communities and things like that. And unfortunately, it's... It's it's like you're you're putting such a heavy burden on people who like their actual skill sets and their core competencies are not in doing what needs to be done. You know, no. I, my, my, my ability to identify different species of bird definitely did not help me in setting up a law organization. But, but it, it, you've identified it and summarized it very succinctly. And it is happening. There are now financial task force task forces specifically going after the proceeds of legal wildlife trade. And there are now British military and other nation military specifically looking at law enforcement responses to escalations in poaching. Uh, th this is it's all now happening from so many different sectors. It's, it's just it's taken a while. It's, it's taken 70 years or so or whatever it is um, of, of these big organizations being run by biologists, people to realize that these are the wrong people to be doing it. Yeah. We need everything. We need biologists, but we need accountants. We need lawyers. We need marketeers. We need soldiers. 
We need human rights people. We, we, we need social scientists. We, we, we need everyone to come together in order to tackle what is one of the largest law enforcement and moral problems of the present day. Yes, I love that. I should. Uh, that's a huge soundbite and incredibly important. I know we're getting close on time, so I just want to go through like a few rapid fire questions. Um, what's one thing that keeps you optimistic in conservation? Like we've talked, kind of, we, we've talked some really optimistic things. We've talked some really pessimistic things. Where do you feel the state of conservation is now? What is there to be optimistic about? And and who are groups that you would consider supporting if you were somebody on the not on the front lines, but really just listening to this podcast and wanting to help the cause. What, what makes me optimistic about conservation is young people. I, I, I do a lot of work in schools. I'll go and I give talks to schools about my conservation work and young people are inherently interested in wildlife, but there does seem also to be a generational shift in the same way as young people are less racist and less homophobic than yeah. the previous generation. Young people are also inherently keen on making sure the planet is there when they have children. And so that's what gives me hope, is the fact that young people are really, really massively engaged in the protection of their planet. In terms of who would I support if I was uh, an armchair conservationist wanting to donate, organizations like African Parks, who are doing direct action conservation projects where they take over, as opposed to just handing stuff over, handing over equipment, handing over cash. They take over and they closely manage. Any organization like that, or big foundations that support direct action conservation, like we're talking Wildcat Foundation, Oak Foundation, these are the types of organizations that can make a difference because they, they have accountability and oversight in the same way as many of the big NGOs just do not have. What do your next five years look like? What, what is the big focus? Uh, big focus for me will be outside of the uh, fact that you're having a kid in like any, any second now. <laughs> now my wife just ran upstairs so i hope that's nothing serious uh, <laughs> yeah uh, so ha having a child and, uh, and introducing them to the world that i live in which which is this world of conservation I, for me to be able to show my, my my kid an elephant a lion and the fact that work that daddy is doing is making sure that they're still there that, that's that's a big focus for me but in terms of professionally it's making sure that we get chisarira national park fully resuscitated, and then we expand that model, that we grow as an organization so that we can take this, this highly successful way of doing things, and we can implement that in other national parks in the same way as African parks have done. They started with one place, they now have nearly 20 national parks, and I would like to see our trajectory going something similar. So within the next five years, I'd like to be working in two national parks. Within the next 10, I'd like to be working in five. Can you look back on all your expeditions, all your conservation work? Is there one special moment that sticks out above and beyond all the rest that you could get really present in that moment and just be thinking to yourself, I can't believe I get to do what I do for a living? I got charged by a tiger twice. Whoa. That was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I've, be, I've been extraordinarily fortunate in, in that I, I, I've, I've gone out and I've sought these types of encounters and, and I've, I've been very lucky to have an extraordinary number of yeah kind of life-changing encounters with wildlife and, and, and natural places but nothing is quite so life-affirming as being stared in the eyes by a Bengal tiger as she bears down upon you shaking the entire forest with her roar. So that, if I could just go back to that one place to remind me of why I wanted to be a biologist in the first place, it would be there. All right. I know we have, you, you're on a tight time crunch, but I have to know more about that story. I'm sorry. Can you, can you, what, what was going, what was going on I, there? It was, it was my fault. I was, I was on a patrol with uh, the national parks in, in Nepal looking for tigers um, I wasn't doing anti-poaching stuff. I was looking to try and film tigers. And I was on a patrol with them, and they patrol on elephant back. I wouldn't normally condone the use of elephants for, for travel, certainly not as a tourist. But the national parks is, is how those rangers patrol. So we were patrolling with them. And we came across a tiger's kill, and she was still nearby. And we were, we were basically stopping her having her dinner. And she wanted to tell us 
<laughs> where to go and when a tiger tells you where to go you go <laughs> like something wow yes i can imagine I don't know. Uh, the elephants the way the elephants respond as well like the elephants are rumbling and that and they're, they're hissing and they're, they're trumpeting and they're talking we were two elephants they're talking to each other and one elephant would be like it's over there and then i'm like no, it's over there and then suddenly bang a tiger's directly in front of you and then boom charged at us cloud of dust Jaws popping, claws going like this, and then you went. It was absolutely unbelievable. And the shake, the, the fact that like my whole body shook from its roar. Like when a tiger roars, just everything shakes. Ooh. Oh, Something. I got goosebumps going on here. That's amazing. Uh, my last question: If you yeah. could put a billboard up on the side of the highway that disseminates one message in ten words or less. What would you put on that billboard? There is no planet B. All right. There's no better way to wrap up a conservation podcast than with that answer. I love that. Thank you so much, Niall. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm going to link all the kind of your website, social channels, nonprofit in the show notes. So for anybody that wants to learn more, check that out. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, stay wild. Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time. For all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc., please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.